If one wants to look at the cost of controlling the environment and compare this to the real cost of people, one has to see that this is a very small cost. The cost of dying is expensive. The cost of medical care is the biggest expense in this society, almost $80 billion. The loss from work, a billion days a year because of acute respiratory illness, this is a great cost. People with emphysema are frequently people who don't work, so that their health costs are burdens on all of society. And these people enter hospitals twice as often as other people, and they stay there twice as long. This is a cost for all of us. Chronic lung disease is the second highest cause of Social Security disability in people under the age of 65. This is more than $100 million a year. This is a tremendous cost. So to make comparisons ridiculous, we have to clean up the air. We have to create a viable environment for all of our people. We cannot tell millions of people that they cannot live in cities, that they have to run away. We still get flack about, well, how do you know that air pollution is really responsible for all these disease states that you talk about? And admittedly, when you're dealing with a chronic illness, such as emphysema or chronic bronchitis, where there are multiple causes, it's hard to say air pollution was responsible for 18% of this man's disability. The system sort of goes back in public health annals to uh, typhoid and its control. It took 40 years for the proofs of the typhoid bacillus and how it got transmitted to people to be established. But some prudent man in England took the handle off the pump that was putting out the contaminated water 40 years earlier because of the association. People drank from that well and they got typhoid fever. Well, that kind of prudent judgment has to be applied in terms of air pollution today. Those of us in medical science feel that there is a clear association between community air pollution and this complex of diseases, and that we really can't afford to wait for 40 years of point-by-point -point matching of challenge and disease to do something about it because things will be too late by then. Decisions being made to control air pollution today are going to have long-range consequences. There are two major reasons for this. First of all, we know that there's a long lag time between a, an environmental influence, an air pollution influence on health, and the development of chronic disease such as cancer or chronic lung disease 20 or 30 years in the future. Secondly, we know that the length of time it takes industry to convert to sophisticated control processes takes a decade or more before enough control is exercised to have a significant influence, to have a major influence on the quality of air 25 or 30 years from now. Although difficult, we have the tools to solve the air pollution problem. Research has demonstrated to us that most pollutants can be controlled and that the air quality standards can be met with the diligent application of these tools. The, the final piece of the puzzle is cost and is the will to, to control air pollution. By the air pollution standards that now exist too strict, you've probably seen ads in a paper making these claims that we're paying an unusual cost a very extreme cost for achieving clean air and that we don't have to have such clean air to preserve human health. The fact of it all is that people who are concerned about human health and who have studied the effects of air pollution on health do not feel that the air quality standards are too strict. Those standards were set with a relatively small margin of safety below the level at which adverse health effects first occur. We have maybe a one, one or two-fold margin of safety below those levels that affect human health. For other standards, such as substances in food or carcinogens or radiation, we set as large as 10 to 100-fold safety standard below the level of adverse health effects. So I don't think that the standards are anywhere too strict, even though those claims have been made. The big question we have to answer now is, what will it do over 70 years? 
What will it do to young children who have just been born? We don't know the answer because we cannot devise experiments that will give us such a 70-year answer. So if we err at all, it must be on the side of caution in order to protect future generations. And when I say future generations, I mean that literally, because one of the bad pollutants, ozone, for example, has been shown to fracture chromosomes. And this is what may lead not only to abnormal growth, like cancer, but possibly even to abnormal births. What has been happening is that we view the air and the water as a free sewer. It's not a free sewer. The environment will not tolerate continuous exploitation. At a certain point, it will tolerate no more. And at that point, we're going to have to come to grips with it and come to some accord with the environment if we're going to build a better life that all of us really want.